Wow, what amazing opportunity to help kick off this year's Human Performance Summit here at the UFC Center. I don't know about everybody here in the room, but I'll tell you, it's nice to see we're getting back to somewhat normalcy uh, with COVID, whatever that might look like post-pandemic. Post Before we get started, though, I'd like us to all thank Marcus and the Fusion Fort team for putting together this, this uh, summit and all the hard work that's gone into it. Can we also give a big round of applause to the UC Training Center for opening up their doors to us for the next couple days to allow us to collaborate, educate, and network with our fellow colleagues on the next generation of Smartabase. <clears throat> In early 2016, I was the Operations Superintendent out at the Apprentice Course at Kirtland Air Force Base, New Mexico. This is the final course for PJs and Combat Rescue Officers in their three-year pipeline. I was sitting in my office one morning about 9.30, drinking my coffee and going through some emails when I heard a knock on the door. A student from the senior class was standing there in my doorway, and the look on his face was telling me right off the bat he wasn't having a good morning. I asked him what did he need, and he started explaining to me that he had just came back from the range and that he had been sent home due to a safety violation and was to be recycled. For those in the room that don't understand what the word recycle is, that's where if we have an individual we see potential in them, We'll go ahead and roll them back into a junior class, which could be two or three years or two or three months uh, later, and then he'll repeat those blocks again. I told him to come, in, come into my office, sit down, and tell me exactly what happened. He said, "Well, I was on the range. I had holstered my weapon, and I forgot to decock it before it went into the holster. Per our curriculum, that was a safety violation. Things just didn't sound right, though, to me. So I said, "You know what? Let's ask a few more questions." I said, "Well, isn't this your first day on the range?" He said. Yeah, Chief, it was my first day, and it was within the first 15 minutes of firing. I said, well, did you have a, was this your second violation? He said, no, it was my first. I said, do you have any other minor issues prior to shooting today? He said, nope, I had nothing. One of the things that I've learned while at the schoolhouse was students have a tendency to paint themselves in the best version in the best light. They want to make sure everybody thinks they were in the wrong. For those in the room that have teenagers, you know exactly what I'm talking about. One thing, or... As I drove out to the range to talk to the instructors to find out exactly what was going on, uh, when I pulled in the parking lot, a couple of the instructors pulled up. So we I had a little bit of small ch chit chat going back and forth. And I said, well, explain to me exactly what happened with the student today. To my surprise, their version of the incident was the same version that the students had, which never the instructors and students' versions line up. So looking at the instructors, I asked, was there a better way that we could have handled this? They looked at me kind of puzzled. I said, well, what? This was his first hour, within his first 15 minutes on the range. What if we had to put him on the very far end of the range, and for 30 minutes, all he did was decock his 9 mil and holster it? After 30 minutes of doing this, that thumb would be so tired and so sore that for the next three days, every time he grabbed that pistol, it would remind him what he has to do before he holsters it. The instructors looked at me and said, no, it's black and white. It's a safety violation. Recycle him. He was recycled three months back and ended up graduating and with no other issues, became an operator and is an operator out there today. This morning, I'd like to share with you my thoughts regarding leadership's role in utilizing training to inspire and build resiliency. By a quick show of hands, though, I want to see who we have out in the audience. So if you're a DOD member or supporting a DOD program, please raise your hand. Okay. If you're an athlete or supporting an athletic program, please raise your hand. Okay. If you're out here because it's an opportunity to be at the UFC Center and spend a weekend in Vegas, raise your hand. Exactly. That's what I thought. So as I mentioned in my bio, I retired this summer after 28 years as a pararescueman. During my career, I deployed countless times to many locations in support of all major conflicts since the early 1990s. I supported multiple DOD agencies, both foreign and domestic. Over the nearly three decades, though, I've observed many training issues and many training opportunities that we have lost due to the failure to actually capture that trainable moment. And the, as the warfighter in today's war is different than when, what the warfighter that came in in 1993 like myself. A few years back, Dean Criswell, a fellow PJ of mine, teammate, he's now the op soup out at Nellis Air Force Base, we we're sitting around having a few beers and we we're talking about this, the attributes. What kind of attributes do we need our candidates to have today? And what level do those attributes need to be developed before they even come into the Air Force? I think Dean articulated it the best. He said 30 years ago, we needed a special warfare operator that could lug around a 14-pound weapon. 
carry an 80-pound pack, and listen to a single radio channel at one given time. Today, though, we need an operator that can carry a four-pound weapon, a 35 to 45-pound pack, but listen to five radio channels simultaneously at the same time, make life and death decisions that used to take hours or days to make. <clears throat> we no longer need an operator that has the physical standards as what we did three decades ago right out the gate. What we need, though, is an operator that's cognitively developed at a much higher level than we ever have in the past. Three decades ago, we did not have human performance staffs like many of you that are in this room today. We didn't have human maintenance facilities that are being erected around the bases, around the world as we speak. We didn't have sensors that can capture the data that we do today. And we didn't have a database such as Smartabase, which could ingest tens of thousands of data points, provide feedback on how the training is going, and, and how is it impacting the operator real time. We are recruiting and developing a different warrior today, but we get stuck and we fail many times in the initial prepare, select, and develop today's warrior by utilizing a lot of the 1990s tactics and mentalities that we have in the past. So here's my challenge to you. As you listen to the guest lectures today and tomorrow, collaborate with your fellow colleagues. Think about as a leader in your area of influence, because every single one of you is a leader. Is the training that you're doing truly a purpose-built training product, or is it a relic event because that's the way it was always done? <clears throat> with the military, we're in a very, uh, uh, we're in a very difficult situation here. We are preparing for our worst days of our lives on, on a day that we never know when it's going to come. We don't have a season. We don't have a scheduled match. We don't have a designated date on the calendar to be ready. We are to be ready when the phone rings, which can be any day at any time, whether you just got back home from a deployment or from a training event. In 1997, I had came back from a four-month deployment, spent two days at home, went up to New Hampshire for 10 days for some medical training, and the night I got home from that, I got a phone call and went back out the door for five more months for Desert Thunder. <clears throat> the challenges for leaders today, because of the, this is a challenge for leaders today, because we get consumed with the day-to-day -day useless fodder, we sometimes lose focus on what the true objective is. Not checking in to see how our people are doing and how their families are handling what's going on. Over the years, I've come up with some tips on leadership, which I've tried to follow, some more successful than others. But this morning, my plan is to talk to you about five of those tips. First tip is leadership is from the front. I know everybody in this room has had some influential leader, coach, or someone they've inspired to be. Otherwise, you would not be sitting in these seats today. For me, there's a leader in the audience that I had the pleasure of working with. Brian and I first crossed paths during our first assignment, or his first assignment in the Air Force in Okinawa, Japan. He had came over from the Navy, where he had been a rescue swimmer for the previous 10 years. He immediately filled the team OIC position, and I was sitting in his op soup at the time. During that 18 months, he and I had many productive and very heated conversations on what he thought was best for the boys, which I loved, and he never had any uh, issues whatsoever to tell you what he thought. A few years went by and we ended up crossing paths again at the schoolhouse. He came in as a commander and I was sitting as the op soup at the time. One of the first things Brian instituted was mandatory PT for everyone in our new renovated facility. This did not go over well because many of the guys liked to do what they wanted to do, whether it was hike, sleep in, maybe work out at the local box gym, but most of them I think was sleeping in. But every morning he was there, first one in the gym or nearly the first one. And if anyone dared to wake, walk in at 6.59, you would hear an echo, you're late. During this transition, he stayed constant with his message. He allowed no excuses, and as a leader, was in, the, was in the front leading the squadron by his actions. Within a few months, that was the first thing everybody did every morning. The laughter, the teamwork, and the mentorship that went on every morning for 75 minutes was priceless. It wasn't uncommon for guys that were on leave would come in off of leave that morning to get their workout in with the team. Unfortunately, Brian, well, I should say unfortunate, but Brian ended up PCSing a, a few, few years later, and the mandatory PT, which was still in place on paper, did not, did not continue. The new commander didn't see the same, uh, did not see the same value in that, and he wanted to do his own thing. Within two weeks, the organization was back to its old ways. Some of the operators were still working out, 
the support were no longer coming in. <clears throat> they went back and they were doing their own thing, which was, again, sleeping in. As I said earlier, everyone in this room are leaders in the area they influence. It's important to keep that in mind because this is always, this is important because there's always somebody watching and trying to mimic your actions, whether they're positive or negative. An example is during prep. Candidates were given 12 hours of nutritional classes. An area of discussion in detail was drinks and energy drinks specifically and a negative effect on their body. Major Torres, our lead dietitian, would get frustrated with the instructors because without fail, she had finished that hydration class. One of the instructors would walk in and what would they have in their hand? An energy drink to announce the next event. Again, these are people who are watching you and mimicking your actions. As a leader, it's easy to say, do as I say, not as I do. We hear our leaders today speak about how important human performance is and how it's vital to the healthy fighting force. Yet, how many of these leaders are actually leading from the front? My second tip, which I think is one of the most important tips, is a teachable moment. As a society and within the military, I feel we have lost the teachable moment. As a leader, you have arrived at this level through many trials and errors, but someone has had the foresight to use those stumbles as a teachable moment. Lieutenant Colonel Ron Stanger asked me to come out to Lackland in January 17 to 2017 to build a, a SW prep course for our candidates coming straight from BMT. His guidance was simple. Josh, if your son or daughter came to you and said, I want to be a PJ, how would you train them? He understood the importance of a teachable moment. And when utilized correctly, you can inspire, you can build resiliency in someone past what they ever thought they were capable of doing. We designated two extended training days in prep. One is on the end of week three, and the other one is sometime during week six. Students would learn more about themselves and their fellow teammates in those 18-hour training days than any other day in the program. They first extend, the first extended training day candidates knew about knew when it was going to happen and at what time it was going to happen. There were several teachable moments on, on that day, but one of my favorite was what we called the Blue Falcon Breakfast. So, this is how it would transpire. Around 2 o'clock in the morning, they'd be woken up. They would have about three hours worth of PT, and then they would head to breakfast. As they were going through the breakfast line, they were told to make their plates and go sit down. Do not touch your food. Now, at this point, understand they have three hours that they've already been PT in. It's six hours of PT before the next meal. They've had around 20 hours worth of nutritional classes at this point. They know what they need for calorie intake. Lo and behold, though, every time, someone would get a banana, a piece of bread, a bowl of cereal, and a glass of milk. So everybody would be sitting at the tables at this point, and we would tell them, did you blue falcon your buddy? Switch plates with the person in front of you, and that is now what he is having for breakfast. Your actions affect the team. The second event that we had that was always a, a great a great event was the 500 meter swim, which happened in hour eight of the extended training day. This one pushed candidates well beyond their comfort zone and built confidence in them. Tac P's, who at the time we did not have a swim requirement, and that made up about 50% of the class size. A lot of them, about 85% of them, couldn't swim a lick when they came in. But we had them swim because it was a great cardio workout, as well as it was a massive confidence boost of what they could accomplish in such a short period of time. I had a student during that, one of those events on a class who could not swim more than about 10 meters when he first got there three weeks earlier. Airman Jones, though, had a great heart, but he lacked confidence in his ability. On that event, he got about 100 meters into the swim, got himself out of the pool, came over to me and said, I quit. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean you quit? He goes, I quit. I can't do this anymore. I'm done. I looked at him and I said, well, first of all, you can't quit until the end of week four. So get your ass back in the water and keep swimming, even if it takes you a couple hours. So with his head hung low, he went back and jumped back in the water. He ended up finishing that swim. As he came in and touched the wall, I was standing right above him. As he looked up and saw me there, he had the biggest grin on his face. And I said, do you still want to quit? And he said, hell no, chief. I just swam 500 meters. Again, a confidence booster. Use it as a trainable moment. So I reached down to him and I said, listen, your next course, if you decide in the heat of the moment to quit, you get no second chances. You're done. He ended up going on past the TACP program and is currently a TACP out in the community as we speak to today. You can never miss the opportunity to learn from a training event. That is why it is called training. Don't pass up a teachable moment. 
My third tip for you today is accountability. As a leader, we must be held accountable for our actions and hold others accountable. After 10 more months of working on a tent facility at our, for our prep program, we were given an old BMT dorm. This facility was perfect for the environment that we wanted to create. Open bay barracks, community showers and restrooms. Now keep in mind, this was at the height of the special operation integration of females. So working with CE, we created a 100% gender neutral residency floor. It was the only one in DOD and to this date, it's still the only one. They would sleep, shit, shower and shave all in the same space together. Now again, we were not space troopers, bathrooms quite, but we were about the closest you could possibly get to it. My thoughts were, if we are true, gonna truly integrate, we need to live together as a team and learn to respect each other and more important, watch out for each other. My third class, I had an airman who I got to know quite well. Airman Garcia, he grew up in Houston in a rough part of town. No father, a hardworking mother, and the oldest of three. He wanted a better life for himself and decided to become a TACP. During prep, you're locked, the candidates are locked down for the first six weeks. The goal is to grow and foster a team environment. On the sixth weekend, they're given base liberty. Garcia had a couple buddies come up from Houston for the weekend, and he booked them a hotel room on base since he wasn't allowed to go off base. He came back from curfew on Friday night with no issues. After breakfast on Saturday, he went back over to hang out with his buddies for the day, but didn't return for curfew that night, and on Sunday morning, I received a phone call from the first sergeant saying that he'd been arrested and he was at jail for getting caught smoking marijuana in the dorms, or in the, in the hotel. The shirt picked him up and I went headed over to prep. After finding the class leader, I'd asked, hey, where's Aaron Garcia at? He kind of looked at me like, hmm. So he spent about 15 minutes scrambling around the dorm trying to find him, and he came back and said, I, I can't find him. So I informed him, go ahead and get the team together and move into the classroom and stand by. By this point, Garcia had been, he'd been dropped back off by the first sergeant and he was sitting in my office. I'd asked him what had happened. He explained to me that his buddies were like his family, and they came into town on Saturday, came in on town. On Saturday, they had pulled out some weed. He knew he shouldn't, but he didn't want his buddies to think that he was better than them, and so he decided to smoke a joint with them. He decided to stay at the hotel instead of come back and break curfew. That morning, he woke up, and he smoked another joint with them, and then that's when the cops were called due to the, the smell of the marijuana, and he was arrested. After listening to him, I explained, those are not your family. Your family are the ones that are upstairs right now, sitting in the classroom waiting to see what's going to happen. Those guys were jealous that you got yourself out of a situation. I went ahead and sent him back upstairs to the dorm to go and pack his stuff. After talking to Garcia, I headed down to the classroom to talk with the students. Now remember, this is open bay barracks. Everybody sees where everybody's at at all times. I asked them, who were the bunkmates, left and right, of Garcia? The individuals raised their hand. I said, did you not notice at curfew when lights were out that Garcia was in his bed? They said, no. I said, when you woke up in the morning, did you not notice his bed was still made? They said, no. So I said, you know, as a team, you guys failed to be accountable for your people, or you just didn't like them. They all said they liked him, and they all vouched for him and said, no, don't kick him out. I use the example because back in the early 2000s, we had a mission where Jake Schomburg was on this mission and they were in a firefight. They loaded everybody up on the helicopters and took off. The problem though was the team leader, nor did the crow realize Jake was left in the fire zone. They did not realize that until they had gotten back and started cleaning up from the mission and someone asked where Jake was. They thought maybe he was in the crapper. So when they realized he wasn't there, then they started putting two together and they started asking each other, was he on your aircraft? No. Was he on your aircraft? No. Luckily Jake made it out there with no issues. And it's a great story if you ever get a chance to listen to it over a couple beers. But again, it goes back to the accountability of your people. Understand and know where they are at all times. My fourth tip is how do we find the opposite of no? On my way out of the recruiter's office in 93, I was faced with, I, had a, I saw a face that changed the trajectory of my life for the next three decades. At that time, I didn't realize how much this man would actually influence my career. Sitting at the end table of a recruiter station was this trifold pamphlet. It had a yellow border and had a picture of a PJ wearing a maroon beret. This PJ was Mike Maltz. That name might sound familiar because Mike was killed in Afghanistan on 23 March 2003 on a rescue mission trying to save two local ch Afghan children. The irony was Mike was never supposed to be there. Mike was slated to retire. But they were short a team later and they asked Mike to pull his paperwork and do one more deployment. And Mike did. 
That's what we all want to do is one more. So he volunteered. <clears throat> After looking through the pamphlet, I turned to the recruiter and said, what about this job? He goes, I don't know much about it. Nobody makes it. Don't bother. Well, that's all I needed to hear. Sign me up, put my paperwork down as being a PJ. At that time, things were a little bit different. You went in as an open general. It means you came into the Air Force with no job. Because about 96% of the people would fail out of the pass test, and then the Air Force would have those people to put them into whatever job they wanted to. So I went, I shipped off to BMT, and on my second Saturday of basic training, I showed up to the pool with about 125, 150 wannabes, just like myself, and I took a pass test. That Saturday, I was excited. I was ready. I knew I could do this. I got through all the exercises, no issues. My last exercise was sit-ups, and I failed. I missed it by two sit-ups, two. Well, I, I walked up, or the instructors told me, grab your shit, head back to the dorms. As I walked up, leaving the place, I asked the instructor, can I have one more chance? Can I please come back Saturday and try again? They said no. Go ahead and train for the next three years, and you can, you can go ahead and put your package in at the three-year mark to try to come back. Well, a few weeks go by, and I received my job. Combat computer technician. Hell yeah, I got a combat job. So I didn't think too much of it. Well, I ended up at the, at the job office to sign my paperwork, and as I told the lady, I was so excited that I ended up getting a combat job. She informed me that there was no combat in this job. I was to sit in a basement behind a computer and do something. Now, I grew up at a high school that had typewriters. We didn't even have computers, so I had no idea what I was getting myself into. All I knew is I did not want to sit in a basement, and I did not want to be on a computer eight hours a day. So as I left the office, I was pissed, and I was strategizing what's my next move. Well, when I came around the corner, to my surprise, there was Mike Maltz, the PJ, that I had seen on the front of that brochure at the recruiter station walking down the hall. I went up to Mike, and I started pleading my case, why I needed a second chance. I went up and down pleading in all different, different scenarios of why he should trust me and give me that chance. I was one of the fastest swim times, one of the fastest run times, which at that time was very difficult to get guys in that could swim and, and run at that speed. He looked at me, decided, let me call back and see what your scores were. He called back to NDOC, confirmed those were my scores, and he came back out and said, yes, come back on Saturday, you get your second chance. A few weeks later, I ended up, all right, I ended up coming back on Saturday and I passed it with no problem. A few weeks later, I graduated BMT and I entered, I showed up to NDOC. To my surprise, guess who was there as my class proctor? Mike Maltz. So, got through the program, graduated a few years later, and my first team I showed up to, my team leader, for the first three years was Mike Maltz, and we did six deployments together. Mike was very influential in me in my life in my early years. What I'm telling you here is, can you continue to push through the nose until you find that person that says yes? But when you get the yes, you better be ready to prove it. My fifth tip is uniformity. From the moment you arrive at special warfare training, one of the major areas of focus is uniformity. There's a few reasons for this. Safety, maintaining consistency within a program, and what I feel one of the most important is, you look like a team, you'll begin to transition as a team. A term used with, when we're communicating with our candidates is called cones. During their early weeks of development, you'll hear the instructors singing a song, one of these cones ain't like the other. This is immediately lets the cones know that someone's fucked up. They start looking around and figure out who's not in uniform. And it's a, quite funny to watch them scramble. They'll get that person's head out of their ass, get them back into the right, right formation. Uniformity has always been important. I had the luxury, though, in 2000, to listen to Jack Canfield speak at the Air Force Ball in Okinawa, Japan. His words drove home the importance of uniformity and how just looking as a team can help drive the culture to success. The example that he used was in the early 1990s, he was asked to go speak to two NFL teams. The first team was the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He walked through the lobby. There was a lady sitting behind the reception desk. Her head was down. She was busy working. He walked up to the desk, said, hi, my name is Jack Canfield. I'm here to speak to the team. She did not raise her head. She said, okay, have a seat over there, and she pointed to some couches. So he went over there and he sat down. He sat there for about 15, 20 minutes. A gentleman walked out, said, please come with me. Took him into the auditorium. In the auditorium, the seats, there was all the players. Around the, the seats and the walls of the auditorium was all the staff. There was nobody in that room that was wearing the same attire. It looked like, as he said, a ragtag bunch of people. A couple weeks go by, he heads out to Dallas to go speak to the Dallas Cowboys. He walks in. 
Immediately he walks in, there's a lady sitting behind the reception desk. She's working away. She stands up. How may I help you? I am Jack Canfield. I'm here to speak to the team. And she said, yes, sir, we've been waiting for you. Please have a seat. Can I get you something to drink while you wait? No, I'm, I'm fine. Within five minutes, some gentleman walks out in a cowboy's polo. He said, sir, please come back with me. He walks into an auditorium, same as the Tampa Bay. Players are sitting in the seats. Staff is around the edge. Every single player is wearing the same shirt. Every single staff member is wearing a Cowboys polo. That next six years, Dallas went on to win three Super Bowls. Tampa Bay was the worst, one of the worst teams in the NFL. Does your team look like a team or a group of individuals trying to play as a team? As you continue to move up your leadership ladder and your sphere of influence expands, keep in mind, what type of leader are you? Do you fall into the leadership traps? Make sure your people see that you believe what you believe is important by your actions and not your words. I'm excited to see where we go over the next five to 10 years. A great example where I think we're going is the movie Mile 22. In this movie, a small sensor is injected into the forearm of each team member. And the operations center has live physiological data coming in to watch how are these guys, how are they performing. With sensors becoming smaller, more capable to collect data and integrate into every facet of our daily lives, we will have the ability to monitor someone 24-7 like we have never done before, which will allow us to continue to learn how to push the human body past a perceived limit. I think Mark Weisner made a very interesting comment back in the early 80s. The most profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they're no longer indistinguishable from it. I think this is more relevant than ever. A great example of the technology advancement is cell phones. Cell phones have integrated themselves into our lives that we never leave home without it. But I forget my wallet all the time. I'll leave you with this. Our goal as leaders is to take those Tom Brady's, those Randy Couture's, those Airman Jones, and use every tool in our arsenal to pull out their potential, to show them they are faster, stronger, smarter, and have more capability than they ever imagined. Everyone in this room has the potential every day to positively impact someone in their lives. We should not be training in an archaic, an archaic way because of the tools that we have today can show us how to optimize that time we have with a member. Again, I want to thank Fusion Sport for asking me to come out and speak, and I want to thank you guys for listening for the past half hour. As I challenged you earlier, use this event to collaborate, educate, network with your fellow colleagues. The industry is moving so fast. Be part of the solution and not part of the problem. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. That was awesome. I'm going to use a few of those tips for sure. Um, any questions? Here we go. I'll just uh, run the mic. Have we got some roving mics? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Did Garcia get to stay? So our decision on Garcia was a little bit different. Um, I'm all about second chances, but because you know, I make a recommendation, my commander at the time is the final decision. Um, because he had smoked the dope, it was a bad issue. What really got me and what really upset me was when he woke up the next morning, had the whole entire night to sleep on it, he decided to do it a second time. And that was really what was the kind of the, the pin that was pulled in my mind. And so uh, what I ended up doing was he was immediately supposed to be uh, discharged from the military. Um, and we ended up basically working with legal. We kept him in and got him another job because he did have some amazing potential and told him to please come back in three years. Just needed to grow up a little bit. But again, it, it was a hard decision because the kid was listening to his story and where he came from. Man, it tugged at your heart.